de regina celorul, am de domina angelorul, salve radic, salve porta, ex-pamundul luxesorta, gaule din vongorilor, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jamie McGuire, and welcome to the inaugural conference of the Portsmouth Institute. The Portsmouth Institute aspires to be a conference, study, recreation, and retreat center for all those interested in questions pertaining to Catholic life, leadership, and service in the 21st century. This year's conference is entitled The Catholic William F. Buckley, Jr. Over the next three days, some of our country's leading public intellectuals will discuss the role William F. Buckley's Catholic faith played in the formation of his thoughts and work. William F. Buckley Jr. was born in 1925, died in 2008, and in his 82 plus years founded National Review, wrote 55 books, thousands of columns, hosted hundreds of firing line television shows, and became recognized as the founder of the modern conservative movement. Many of Buckley's early colleagues in writing and work, his brother-in-law, Brent Bozell, uh, Jim McFadden, Wilmore Kendall and Russell Kirk, to name but a few, were or became Catholics. As George Nash wrote in the conservative intellectual movement in America since 1945, Buckley and his colleagues believed that education, to be worthy of the name, must lead students to the sure knowledge of the permanent truths. Responding to a question about why they were religious in a popular magazine some years ago, a broad cross-section of celebrities prattled on for several paragraphs. Our subject answered with concision. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Indeed he did, and had from a young age, as he wrote in his 1997 book, Nearer My God, about the end of his own year of schooling at St. John's Beaumont, the Jesuit school near Windsor he attended before returning to America to enter Millbrook. I had been notwithstanding the distance from home, very happy there, and I knew absolutely, of this there was simply no doubt, that I had a deep and permanent involvement in Catholic Christianity. I am a senior citizen now, and my faith has never left me. And I must suppose that Father Sharkey, and Father Manning, and Father Payne had something to do with it. They, and the closest I felt every morning to the mystical things that were taking place on the altar. And yet Bill Buckley, though blessed with an impervious faith, was not always predictable in his Catholic views. He resisted the reforms that came out of Vatican II preferred the Latin Mass, and did not suffer what he considered to be the bishop's foolishness in their pastoral letter on the economy at all gladly. American Magazine called for his excommunication when he employed Gary Will's characterization of a papal encyclical on an NR cover, Mater Si, Magistra, No. But he also questioned the church's teaching on birth control, early on called for Cardinal Law's resignation, and was the first to confess that he was no theologian. All of this, to my mind, helps make him a richer and more interesting subject for this conference. Our first speaker is uniquely qualified to talk to us on the Catholic way about Buckley Jr. this afternoon. The chief celebrant and homilist at Bill Buckley's Memorial Mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral, he has been a longtime friend and spiritual director to the Buckley's, now pastor of Our Savior Church in the Archdiocese of New York. Father George Rutler holds degrees from Dartmouth, Oxford, and Johns Hopkins and has written 13 or 14 books and countless columns and sermons. Father Rutler has a Catholic with a small sea circle of friends that extends to popes, potentates, and presidents. But he and I first met at the wake of our mutual pal, Frankie Rabondo, the longtime maker d' at P.J. Clark's. <laughs> Among his many distinctions, I especially want our younger listeners to know Father Rutler is a member of the U.S. Squash Rackets Association, and may come out of retirement and accept challenges from all comers later in the evening after praying the rosary. <laughs> but first, he will offer us his thoughts and reminiscences about his friend, William F. Buckley Jr., who called Father Rutler simply the greatest speaker in the church today. Ladies and gentlemen, Father George W. Rutler. I'm delighted with the idea of this conference. I wish I could uh, attend all uh, the days. I have to go back tomorrow morning for a wedding. Been in my parish not quite eight years, and this will be my 351st wedding. I sometimes wish our Lord had performed his first miracle 
had an elopement. <laughs> my uh, first duty today is to express my thanks to William F. Buckley Jr., as I now can do in prayer, for his gift of friendship. Chesterton said that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. Uh, some of you, you know, far longer than I. But in the nearly 30 years since he befriended me, my happiness was doubled and doubled again. By the many ways he surprised me and made it impossible to express gratitude enough. I like to think that all those convivial dinners he gave for his friends were like those early underground Christian fellowship dinners, the refrigeria. Although Pat might not have appreciated the comparison of the Maisonette on East 73rd Street with the Roman catacombs. <laughs> the definition of the Catholic Church as here comes everybody is one of those quotations said to have been said by someone who did not say it. James Joyce has the line in Finnegan's Wake, but it is not clear if Joyce meant it for the church. We do know that when he left the Catholic Church, a lady asked him if he'd become a Protestant. And Joyce replied to the invasion of his privacy, I lost my faith, not my reason. <laughs> so Joyce indicated that if he was an atheist, he was a Catholic atheist. <laughs> William Buckley was a Catholic theist. And anyone who even obliquely encountered his circle of friends, which seemed to include almost everybody, found the circle a bit like Pascal's circle, whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Bill would have delighted in pointing out that Pascal cribbed that definition from Nicholas of Cusa, who cribbed it in turn from Empedocles, and that Voltaire typically claimed it as his own. Uh, the Buckley circle of friends would have included all of them, and the bill was the center, its circumference included many who are here, and it would have included all who are here if they had met him. And what I um, want to say, I shall allude occasionally to John Henry Newman, who was an inspiration to our subject, and not more appropriately than now, when I say that in his circle, Bill was Newman's prototypical gentleman who makes light of favors while he does them, and seems to be receiving when he is conferring and who does not slander or gossip, treats his enemy as a potential friend, and is merciful to the absurd. Wonderful praise. His mercy was even extravagant, as when he told that firing line guest, I would like to take you seriously, but to do so would affront your intelligence. <laughs> that quality of mercy was strained once, as I recall, in an exchange at the Democrat uh, Convention in Chicago. And then he produced a long and elegant article explaining himself. I think in that instance he sensed that he was dealing with an individual whose dark views were not of this world. A postmodern relativist finds it hard to believe that somebody really does believe. If someone professes Christianity, he assumes that there must be another motive. For the postmodernist, it is essentially a watered-down Kantian, that is, a narcissist without the moral imperative. And such a person analyzes others primarily in terms of how they helped or neglected him. This is typical of our me generation, but it has antecedents all the way back to Eden. One example is the lugubrious Baron von Hugo, who decided that Newman was not a saint because he did not express joy. Now, a wiser man pointed out that the only recorded instances of Newman not seeming joyful were the three times he was visited by von Hugo. <laughs> 
one can be so focused on the self that one is oblivious to the effect one has on others. And this is a subtle and untutored uh, sociopathology which can have results that are not mild. It certainly makes for bad biography. Self-referential cultural dilettantes uh, will not understand what Christopher Dawson meant, that there can be no culture without worship of something other than the self. They will think that Buckley's worship of God was one of his little ways, a harmless culturism or romantic eccentricity in an otherwise worldly man. They will try to perpetuate his political philosophy without his reverential memory. But that definition of uh, Buckley, with religion as one vestigial element, among many other components, is nothing more than the pedantic bread grinds, approved uh, the description of a horse as quadruped, reminivorous, and so on. Buckley is only a political commentator or writer who attended Mass on Sunday. is not Buckley at all. His race for mayor of New York showed that he was more a Cincinnatus than a politician. And he even sniffed something déclassé in politics for its own sake. And considered the term professional politician a douche of the moral. Buckley knew that piety is a virtuous combination of reverence for God and one's ancestors. And by making man ageless, it saves him from the conceit which thinks that his generation is the first in history to have come of age. Some of his finest writing was the special art forms of uh, obituary, eulogy, and panegyric. And this he did with a special skill for members of his own family which is the most difficult craft. What he called his autobiography of faith, near my God, is dedicated to his mother. His richest inheritance from his father was his religion. It is highly significant that he always added Junior to his name, long after his fame eclipsed his father's. For it was from his father that he learned the faith of his father. It is also important that in a society in which marriage has become a temporary convenience instead of the sacrament, he was a faithful husband for 57 years in sickness and in health until death. Without that covenantal understanding of human obligations and the tradition of man, the philosophy of conservation is doomed to dwindle into an aesthetic sentiment. When Buckley died, the Chicago Tribune was one of the many such journals that called him a national institution. I suppose that being a national institution is preferable to being in one. <laughs> but that kind of rhetorical embalming cannot dismiss the man so easily. There are things more pretentious than national institutions. And any nation, and aware of that, eventually ceases being a nation at all. And this is why I think uh, Whitaker Chambers would have served as a kind of St. Paul uh, to Bill. Chambers knew that the struggle against communism was one battle in a larger spiritual warfare, faster than nations, and as old as original sin. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. St. Paul to the Ephesians. If you want a description of the Catholic Buckley, it will not be like Radgrind's horse. It will be like Chambers' witness. For Chambers wrote, a witness in the sense that I am using the word is a man whose life and faith are so completely one that when the challenge comes to step out and testify for his faith, he does so 
disregarding all risks, accepting all consequences. That Buckley spelled Catholicism with a C, both major school and mini school. This is human domain fraternity included all who were humane. He eulogized his friend Richard Cloman, saying that he had both always subconsciously looked out for the total Christian, and when I found him, he turned out to be a non-practicing Jew. It will require the balance of my own lifetime to requite what he gave to me. By so saying, he echoed the Biglietto address of Cardinal Newman, who admired in the classical liberalism of his day, that, as he put it, which is good and true, the precepts of justice, truthfulness, sobriety, self-command, and benevolence. That tribute, however, was not left as a dangling sentiment of indifferentism. Newman disdained a vague philanthropy which holds, as he said, <clears throat> that there is no positive truth in religion, but that one creed is as good as another. It is inconsistent with any recognition of any religion as true. It teaches that all are to be tolerated for all our matters of opinion. And since then, religion is so personal a peculiarity and so private a possession, he must of necessity ignore the intercourse of man with man. If a man puts on a new religion every morning, what does that tell you? It is as impertinent to think about a man's religion as about his sources of income or his management of his family. Religion is in no sense the bond of society. In his collected speeches, uh, Buckley quotes Bernard Hiddens Bell who said that for many, religion is now seen as an innocuous pastime, preferred by a few to golf or canasta. I think that one evidence of the depth of Buffy's eschatology was his neglect of golf. <laughs> he had nothing against it, nor did I ever hear him mock people who collect butterflies or watch professional sports. But I do not think he could explain why so many homo sapiens do those things. He was persuaded by the Catholic interpretation of man and so convinced that while he had many difficulties about doctrine as he tried to thrash them out, but most energetically, if eclectically, in his book, Near My God, he said in good conscience that never once had he ever questioned his faith. And this is exactly what Newman explained by saying that a thousand difficulties do not make one doubt. Buckley's approach to theology was not an apologia, but an inquiry, which is why he called his book, Nearer My God. And he explained, quote, that is an incomplete phrase, but then my thoughts are incomplete. And I pray that my faith may always be whole he should have been pleased that a, a reviewer of that book in the National Catholic Reporter, which he found useful as a source of wrong opinions on almost every subject, <laughs> said, read it and wince, read it and weep. His myutic approach to theological conversation seemed like a difficult labor, rambling and tentative. As he put it, truth is a demure lady much too ladylike to knock you on your head and drag you to her cave. She is there, but people must want her and seek her out. He struggled to understand the systematic analysis of Paul VI's humanity, but he lived long enough to know that it was perhaps the definitive prophecy of the modern age. And all the demographic, moral, and political denouement of these subsequent decades proved that its warning and prediction, which contemporaries mocked as histrionic, were in lamentable fact understated. His final response was the logic of the Logos. He said, the answer for a Catholic has to be 
the position taken by the Pope as spokesman for the Magisterium. High moments in the annals of the firing line included discussions about the soul with Mother Teresa, Malcolm Muggeridge. Lesser in that order was a program on liberation theology, the hot theological topic of the day, exactly 25 years ago, last Friday. He and I, and the late moral theologian, Monsignor William Smith, we talked about it, and I must say, we uh, sounded as though we were discussing economic dialectic at the Congress of Vienna. A transcript of that program is available on Amazon with a current sale ranking of 5,441. <laughs> but Bill told me that it had the most voluminous viewer response of any program up to that day. I do remember receiving a letter from a woman who thought the Swiss government was planning concentration camps in Paraguay. He was chronically annoyed by the canard that he had authored the cynical prescription Mater Si Magistra No, in reference to the quip which appeared in one line of the National Review's gossip column. He regretted that its flippancy lent itself to abuse, and he wrote to a Jesuit publication, do the editors of America sincerely believe that I have decided to reject the depositum fide because along came an encyclical whose rhetorical emphasis disappointed me. Proceed, if you like, publicly to despair over our insouciance or frivolity, but to edge us into infidelity is more than uncharitable. It is irrational and, in the true sense, scandalous. Now, Buckley was not a clone of Wars Rex Machum, who thought that the Pope could predict the world. He was on solid ground in distinguishing <coughs> magisterial pronouncements and prudential prescriptions. And in his fear that truths may be expressed by John uh, the 23rd's Mater et Magistra in ways that, as he explained, could be co-opted by such declared enemies of the spiritual order as the new statesman and the Manchester Guardian, which hailed the conversion of the Pope to socialism. Here, I think, was an affinity uh, with some of the inopportunists of the 19th century, those who accepted the dogma of the papal infallibility while questioning its uh, timing. Later, his profound reservations about Paul VI Popolorum Progressio and more serious criticisms of a weaker document on economics by the bishops of the United States were vindicated by John Paul II's Centesi Musanos. One wishes he were with us now as Benedict XVI prepares his next encyclical on the same subject. Buckley enjoyed whimsically posing as the other side of the papal coin, infallible in matters not having to do with faith and morals. <laughs> and nothing fascinated him more than the papacy and nudged him into the realm of holy humility than the fact that when he and David Niven were presented in a private audience, John Paul II had not the slightest idea who they were. <laughs> His favorite prayer was the rosary, the busy man's oratory. And he often used his fingers instead of the beads, especially on airplanes. I know he often prayed the rosary for others. He was as ordered in his religious practices as in the discipline of his writing. And they were part of a whole, since man's work is a means of sanctification, if done well for a high purpose. He died at his desk, which, dare I say, had become a prayer desk. Of course, modern liturgical revisions were a mortification, and he told of a wedding in the hyperactive notice ordo, youth, which he attended with Pat, whom he vilely called an innocent Anglican. She clutched his hand and asked what was going on. He hesitatingly tried to defend the happy, clappy rituals. <laughs> he said, my own reaction had been the protective reaction of the son whose father, a closet drunk, 
is spotted outside his household, unsteady on his feet. Blessedly, he lived to see the first stages of Pope Benedict's reform of the reform. Given his affinity for words, he felt a personal wound when the American bishops approved the absurd infelicities in a neutered translation of the Bible. On his 80th birthday, I suggested that he was a good age for the papacy. <laughs> Though we knew that his marital state and speaking engagements precluded that. Nonetheless, I proposed as his uh, papal motto, Psalm 44, verse 2. Lingua mea calamus scrive velocite scriventis. My tongue is the pen of a writer who writes fast. <laughs> that might have tempted him. He was also serious about Lent. When he sent me one of his Blackford Oaks novels, I wrote to him saying that even from my remote and limited perspective, his description of the protagonist's act of carnal congress was gratuitous and anthropologically unconvincing. <laughs> he replied that we should discuss this if I were permitted to do so during the penitential season. <laughs> <clears throat> His Christian longing for death, when death was due, could only be thought suicidal for those who do not take eternity seriously and have never prayed for the grace of a holy death. He was very precise in consulting a priest about ordinary and extraordinary means of preserving life when Pat was dying. And he prayed for his own good death, but in God's good time. He did not take counsel that excused sin. Buckley's fifth gospel was human history itself, as it bore witness to the truth of the prophets. When he stood athwart history, shouting, Stop! He was yelling at human pride and not at the Lord of history. Catholicism describes history in big dimensions. St. Augustine said that the Holy Gospel is deep enough for elephants to swim in and shallow enough for lambs to wade in. <clears throat> the Catholic vision, transcending tribalism and clannishness, is universal in a way more organic than international. Buckley was a Catholic before he was a conservative. And that saved his conservatism from both narrowness and nostalgia. Catholicism conserves a tradition of life itself, of which the church is the embodiment. And anything less is philosophically tentative. For if the virtuous man is the totality of what man can achieve by nature, it is not the totality of what man is called to be by grace. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And those words were written by the youngest apostle, John, who had watched Christ being crucified. In my own panegyric on the hill, I recall a retreat in this very abbey uh, when he led the recitation of the Stations of the Cross. I do remember his lengthy pause at the ninth station and his voice reading, Jesus calls a third time. He said third differently from the way he said first and second. A third time. We imitate Christ because in his perfect humanity he imitated us and forth and fall and fall again. But Christ got a third time, and so do we. And that night, Bill announced it was time for confession, and he led me into this abbey church. As I recall, we both tripped into a thorn bush, <laughs> having already been attacked by some vicious sand flies. And when we could not find a light switch, he said, I can get around this church in the dark. <laughs> I since read into that a prophecy more than he meant. I do know that he regularly made his confession as a man who was not deceived. A man of natural virtue will ask forgiveness of other men, but a man of grace asks forgiveness of God. 
Buckley was bemused by, but always convinced of, Hilaire Belloc's arch Catholic pronouncement in 1920. But a man who does not accept the Catholic faith who writes himself down as suburban. Buckley's manifold ways of saying this was a harpsichord translation of Belloc's kettle drum. But the tune was the same. And it was not incidental music, because the consequences of deafness to it have been sinister and catastrophic. One day, Bill telephoned me for the exact wording of lines Belloc had written after gazing upon the ruins of Tinga in North Africa, a city destroyed by the Randalls after it had lost its cultural balance. And I was happy that I could recall that and was moved that he had them rattling in his head. And these are the words. We sit by and watch the barbarian we tolerate him. In the long stretches of peace, we are not afraid. We are tickled by his irreverence, his comic inversion of our old certitudes and our fixed creeds refreshes us, we laugh. But as we laugh, we are watched by large and awful faces from beyond. And on these faces, there is no smile, no smile. No smile on those faces is behind the faces of the <clears throat> smiling biologist who assures us that a moral choice is justified by the autonomous act of choosing. And the smiling politician who promises change in the social order without regard for what is order. And the smiling jurist who says that at the heart of liberty <clears throat> is the right to define one's own concept of existence of meaning or the universe of the mystery of life. In contrast, if there is that heir to a long classical culture, Benjamin Cordozo, someone now contending that he was not the first Latin member of the Supreme Court. But he did graduate from college with honors in Latin. He knew the difference between sentiment and truth and said, opinion has a significance proportionally to the sources that sustain it. I have said that Newman, uh, Buckley, was an Iranian gentleman, but not the mere deontologized lightweight for whom conservatism is a thing that can survive without the classical tradition of culture. Buckley was well aware of the social vandal who has manners but no morals. Newman described that fatuous substitute for the real gentleman. Until recently, that sort was called a yuppie. Uh, but now that specimen has spread into multiple forms of social vandals produced by the general neglect of the liberal arts and sacramental grace. In his idea of the university, Newman describes these characters common to various political schools today, who are incapable of mounting the political movement the way Buckley did, because they are stagnant and cannot move themselves. Newman says, mistaking animal spirits for vigor and overconfident of their health, ignorant of what they can bear and how to manage themselves, they have no principles laid within them as a foundation for the intellect to build upon. They have no discriminating convictions and no grasp of consequences. They are merely dazzled by phenomena instead of perceiving things as they are. Political conservatism, torn from it, the theos which ordered all life, and the logos which explains that life, and the beatific vision which is life's ultimate purpose, will fade to a utilitarian calculus which, like its political opposite, finds the definition of life itself above its pay grade, thinks liberty is the grant of the government, and does not know what happiness to pursue. Without a higher vision to animate it, the secular conservative city set on a hill 
who have little to distinguish it from the secular liberals upper west side of New York. By a remarkable providence, the 12-year-old Bill Buckley was at the Heston Aerodrome when Chamberlain waved the signed paper promising peace for our time. Bill would see many such barterings as the field changed from fascism to communism. But in each instance, his belief in God recognized in the spirit of accommodation with evil, the deadly sin of sloth, which is worse than naivete. In the short times in Bill's memorial mass in the Cathedral of St. Patrick, two priests who flanked me at the altar, Father Fitzpatrick and Father Newhouse, had died. Bill frequently discussed his faith with them in this life, that there are no disputations in the larger life, where there are no maisonettes but many mansions, and no debates for all his song. One of my last dinners with Bill was joined by his nephew, Tom Michael, the Benedictine whose monastic life, Bill said, must be the happiest of all. The three of us met in a private room in the New York Yacht Club an unlikely place to discuss the gospel that Christ preached from the small fishing boat in Galilee. I took it as an example of the development of doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of Nearer My God, he quotes Don Michael's reminder that agonia is the Greek for combat. And that a life which is not a daily spiritual combat is pitiful, for such a life is without love. A Bill had not meticulously arranged his own last liturgy, and so I chose as one of the hymns a paraphrase of John Milton, which we had sung together shortly before in my church. <clears throat> he who would valiantly, against all disaster, let him in constancy follow the Master, as no discouragement shall make him once relent his first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. Whoso beset him round with dismal stories do but themselves confound his strength the more is. No foe shall stay his might, though he with giants fight, he will make good his right to be a pilgrim. And since, Lord, thou dost defend us with thy spirit, we know we at the end shall life inherit. When fancies flee away, I'll fear not what men say. I'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. Thank you so much, Father Rutler, for that elegant description of Buckley's Catholicism, and I know I'm not the only one, I, I suppose I'm not the only one in the room who's especially grateful for the clarification about the Mater Si Magister No Quit, which uh, uh, we see now was indeed a quip, and it was of the, off of the uh, tongue of one who writes quickly, and that uh, Buckley was sorry, unhappy to have it. Uh, set in stone and uh, sort of used against him. Um, before I open the floor to questions, I wonder, because uh, as you know, tomorrow Pope Benedict on the Feast of the Sacred Heart is going to inaugurate the, his special year that he has called for priests, for the sanctification of priests. And uh, I wonder uh, if you could tell us anything about how uh, Bill Buckley uh, thought of the priesthood and especially during this past decade with all of these uh, scandals and troubles, whether there's anything that uh, you would care to, or is it, that's maybe not a good question. It's <laughs> <laughs> a very good question. I'm afraid I don't have a very good answer. <laughs> the Bill's uh, relationship with priests was functional in a Catholic way. The Italians have a saying, 
un papa molto fa un altro, one pope dies, you make another. It's not said irreverently, it's a tribute to the fact that there's an apostolic succession. The bill was not keen on the cult of personalities in, in the priesthood. A priest is a priest, one comes, one goes. And he understood that when there was a priest there, he uh, could avail himself what the priest was supposed to be doing there, receiving the sacraments. Always had a great respect for priests. I know there were some priests with whom he disagreed on many subjects, but I never saw him in any way that show anything but uh, respect uh, for the office. Uh, Pope uh, Benedict will be inaugurating this holy year for priests tomorrow, significantly on the feast of the Sacred Heart. The Sacred Heart is the, the symbol of the divine love which the priest is supposed to share with the people. That's what our Lord did on the cross. That's what the priest does when he offers the sacrifice of the, uh, of the altar. And he's also uh, uh, declared that St. John Vianney, who is the patron saint of uh, parish priests, will now be patron saint of all priests, even Jesuits or everything. Every <laughs> When, when he was, when, when uh, Pius X, with great devotion to Vianney, wanted to make him a patron of, uh, of parish priests, he was very careful to say that he tried his best at his studies. Uh, uh, he was, by common repute, not the brightest of men. The fact is, he was very much underestimated. He was a very bright man. Uh, he just uh, he didn't have that sort of mental uh, engineering that was able to be deducted and thought, but he was intuitive. And he revered <laughs> books. He would be found in the sacristy early in the morning, fast asleep, having spent all night copying out the, uh, the uh, Cappadocian fathers, trying to understand what they were saying. And the fact that uh, the Pope has chosen Vianney <coughs> and making his universal patron, I think is a reminder both to priests, but they're supposed to be as priests, and to the, the people of the church, why they had priests. Uh, Bill, I think, very much understood that. And he was deeply absorbed, he really was deeply absorbed in prayer at Mass. He was kind of hyperactive, we all know that. I think that's why he really found the rosary a kind of uh, attractive devotion, because it was something you could do while you were moving. Uh, but at the altar and in the confessional, he understood what the priest was, it was very clear. And he trusted every priest, which I found very edifying and helped me be a better priest. Thank you, thank you. That was a good question, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, does anyone else have a question that he or she would like to ask? Yes. Father, do, you, uh, do I understand you to say that uh, Bill Buckley finally made his peace with Yamani Vita uh, as, as the, the so called birth control of Sepulchre? Well, he made his peace with Humanae Vitae to the extent that he said, if it's true, it's true. That's basically what he says in Nero My God. He, he interviewed me in that book, and um, he said that I took a much more uh, rigorous line than he would have hoped for. He had mental reservations about it, but number one, in the material order, he said, if this is authentic teaching of the church, one has to acknowledge that. Um, he said, he opened the door to the possibility, and this is wrong, since it's a matter of natural law, that there might be some revision of it. Uh, and, and actually, in the book, he says he hoped that if it did happen, it would happen after I had gone to my reward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was the if, and I think he was just looking for a little 
gracious way, uh, saying he didn't, he still didn't understand the theology of natural law. But he recognized the authority of it. And I, I do think in these uh, latter years, uh, he did recognize too how prophetic it was as far as the sheer in the utilitarian sense, demographics, uh, the consequences, the moral consequences of the nation of abortion. I remember when Humanae Vitae was published. I was in Oxford at the time. I was not a Catholic. And uh, I didn't really even know too much about birthing babies. Uh, but there was a, an American priest who had been studying in Belgium at Louvain. And he was at the university doing some research. He was beside himself. He was furious. He thought this was the most ridiculous thing, the most terrible thing. I don't know what ever happened to this fellow. The states of it because he was wearing clericals, but he had white socks on. And I thought, if he wore white socks, he must be a modernist. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, it is absolutely absurd because he said, it, I still remember this. He said, it, 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 he's suggesting you know, that, that if, in some way, uh, birth control is tied in with abortion and euthanasia. It'll lead to that someday. Isn't that absurd? Well, we now know that it was not absurd. <laughs> yes, another question there. What was uh, Mr. Buckley's views on Pope John Paul II's involvement the Solidarity Movement? And uh, did we ever contrast that with um, uh, Pope Benedict XVI's uh, involvement with uh, geopolitical things in the Middle East where he's passing. Well, I, I don't, you know, he, he wasn't aware of uh, Benedict XVI and the present situation, of course. He was very happy with the election of Benedict the Sixteenth, and he saw a continuity there with John Paul the Second. This real politic. Uh, he, he he was very dismayed with what he considered to be a, a, a more naive political posture uh, in previous times. The Ostpolitik, as it was called in the Vatican, reaching compromises with 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 Marxism especially at the time of Cardinal Casaroli, who was in the Secretary of State, uh, which was Paul the, the Paul the Sixth. He was, I think he was immensely moved uh, by just the election of John Paul II. He really did see in that that something supernatural going on, the sheer timing. We have to remember, John Paul I was elected, he reigned for four weeks and he died. I think Centuries from now, people will say that that was all part of a divine plan. In a way, he was a kind of martyr, breaking the ice for the election of this man from Eastern Europe. Uh, as he was dying, uh, the bill was writing about Ronald Reagan, and he was in constant uh, communication with Reagan about, uh, about the Pope and Mrs. Thatcher. John Sullivan who was with the National Review, wrote a book on those three. And I think that's the lens through which uh, uh, the, the bill also saw that. <clears throat> I had a friend who was delegated by President Reagan to explain what Star Wars. And he told me that he took a uh, Polish-American soldier with him to, to hold the maps. And they opened the maps for the Pope and everything, and he pointed out where all these missiles are. <clears throat> this is a time we have to remember. People forget it now, or they've suppressed it. When President Reagan was being literally hanged in effigy on 42nd Street uh, because of the Star Wars 
One million people marched down 42nd Street, uh, lynching, calling for the lynching of Ronald Reagan. The news doesn't talk about that very much. Now, <coughs> and of course, they were really no more friendly to him than they were to President George W. Bush. But when the maps were open and this was explained to the Pope, the Pope said, I understand all this. And he was very supportive of President Reagan and the British government on that. And Bill knew that. He knew that well. Anyone else? Over here, sorry. I think National Review has been a tremendous friend and supporter of the State of Israel. Um, even though the initial Zionists were very secular, did Mr. Rockley ever reveal that he had theological overtones or uh, for his support for the State of Israel? Not to, uh, not to my knowledge. He did appreciate the fact that we did have this democracy there and we were committed to it. Uh, we know that at the end of his life, he, in retrospect, he was critical of our military strategy in Iraq. In fact, he, he and I disagreed to a certain extent about that. But I mean, he certainly had no theological underpinnings. I thought it quite ironic today, reading that apparently the Hamas uh, rescue a former president, Jimmy Carter, from an Al-Qaeda assassination attempt. This is quite remarkable since, you know, Carter has certainly, certainly been not been a friend of Israel. But now he certainly has some debt to pay there. Reminding me of the story of the soldier who, the sailor who saved Harry Truman when he fell off the presidential yacht. And Truman said, you've saved the president's life, I'll give you anything in my power uh, that you want. And he said, well, I think I'd like a grave, a free grave. And he said, well, I could give you an appointment to Annapolis if you'd like. No, he said, I'd like a grave. He said, well, you're a young man, why are you worrying about a grave? Of course, this states the story. He said, well, I'm from Vermont, and when they hear that I've saved the life of Harry Truman, <laughs> <laughs> Vermont's changed very quickly, so I don't know. I don't know what the general Israeli response will be to saving the life of President Carter. We've got to get him saved, but uh, no, I don't think I don't think that uh, Bill saw those so that in a theological way. Nor do I think most Catholics. It's more of a focus of uh, certain uh, evangelicals who have an apocalyptic sense of a literalist sense of uh, Israel on the end of the world. So, Dr. Flanagan. Mm. Uh, Mr. Buckley was a fan of Europe, or at least skiing in Gestad. And what might be, might, might have been his thoughts in terms of Europe trying to refine, refine its Christian Catholic roots? which uh, Pope Benedict is obviously very concerned that it has lost. Did he speculate in that regard? Well, I think it's going to be on that because uh, it's not a question simply of the religious culture of Europe now. It's, it's a question of Europe itself. Demographically, it's hard to see how what we know as classical Europe can survive in this next generation. I think most demographers say, for instance, that within 20 years, uh, Germany will be an Islamic Republic. And those statistics are irrevocable. One of the, a few years ago, uh, Bill had me and Knut Dean to lunch at Peonies. History will record peonies as sort of the great salon of Manhattan in the 20th century. Uh, and you know, Knopf Dean spoke 3,000 languages and so on. And the, the one time I remembered Bill, totally silent through the whole lunch, because we were arguing, Knopf Dean and I were arguing about 
the Habsburg succession, another important subject. Uh, but it was, I think, it was uh, he, uh, Colonel Levine, had very much given uh, Bill an appreciation of what Belloc meant when he said, uh, Europe is the faith, the faith is Europe. And that's been widely misinterpreted. Uh, he wasn't being provincial at all. But when he did say that, Europe was the cultural center of the world. What he meant by that was that you cannot separate Europe, as, we, as it's defined, from uh, Christianity, and specifically Catholic Christianity. Uh, and I think the present events prove that. The debate in the European Parliament proves that, that the European Constitution. I was reading some, someone recently pointed out the US Constitution. You know, there's a small pamphlet you could put in your pocket. Oh, this is Mark Stein said that. He said, if you try to put the, you can't walk around with the European Constitution in your pocket, you will go lame. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a thousand pages. And no mention of Catholicism. And if you remember, that was a big crusade of John Paul II uh, to have a recognition of theism as, as the core of European identity, and it did not attain. Uh, the monastic community is in need of getting on its way towards Vespers at 5.30, and you're all most welcome to join them there. If I may ask Father Rutler to stay behind for a moment or two, if anyone wants to approach closer and ask a, a further question or two, I'm sure he'll entertain it. Thank you all very much.